Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And before we get into looking at God's word again in Daniel chapter 11, let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence into our midst. And we are so thankful for all the things that you show us. And we pray for one another. We pray for this movement. We pray for Elder Jeff and others, Lord, who you have used in your work and um, and those that you are presently using. We know, Lord, that um, we need to do the little things that you've given us to do and to be obedient. And so we just ask, Lord, that you can help us, that you can correct us of any error we may have in our understanding, and that you can guide us into all truth. We invite your spirit to speak to our hearts, to bring conviction and power to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Um, you now, somebody complained nicely, but uh, on uh, one of the videos, I think it was number 171, and this is number 175, so I guess that would be Sundays. But they complained that, you know, we take too long to get to the point in these studies. And, of course, the reality is we don't know what the point is. If we knew the answer... If I was just doing a presentation on something that I've, I've studied and understood, it'd be quite a bit different. Right now, we're gleaning, and this process is slow. And my sympathies go out to those who are following these studies or trying to and find that, wow, aren't they ever moving slowly? Um, but we have to do it this way. There's, this is what we've been called to do. And we find lots of things and notice lots of details that uh, – we would not have noticed if we had quickly gone through these verses. And some people may question whether this is, is as profitable as, as, it, as it should be. Well, one of the things that I find in doing this is we do fix things in our minds much more clearly and much more solidly. Because I've done lots of studies on Daniel chapter 11. And I can tell you, after going through the verses that we've done so far, we're well, pretty much all through Daniel 11. We have, at least I personally can remember much more of the details and understand and see much more clearly how everything is connected. That it's not just a bunch of historical events that were selected arbitrarily just so that we could have this continuation of that period of time, that they're all purposeful, all connected to the 70 weeks and the 2300 days and the 2520 in giving us an understanding of it. And also, of course, we have the present truth application, the repeat of history. And, and the, one of the reasons that we study Daniel chapter 11 is that Ellen White uh, specifically talks about the repeat of history of Daniel 11. So I'm just going to find her exact words. Um, let me see. History. Let's see if I can find it here quickly. I should remember where these things are. So lots of times she talks about history being repeated, but specifically this one dealing with Daniel chapter 11. Anybody know exactly? If you just type in, yeah, if you just type in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. Because um, she's going to talk about Daniel chapter 11. So she... Yeah, so this would be, okay, um, this I have letters and manuscripts to medical missionary work and going to Battle Creek, May 28th, 1998. So this is, I don't know, so this is a collection, a miscellaneous collection. It should be uh, manuscript 13. Okay, I'm going to look, manuscript 13, do you know what year? Um, I can't remember no. Yeah, for some reason, I always have trouble finding the statement. Yeah, this one's not the one. Even if you just go to the scripture reference and go to uh, Daniel 11, verse 36. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, well, finding other ones of Daniel and Revelation. History will be repeated. There's a scriptural reference section. Have you gone there? Mm, yeah. But it's uh, there's only like what she only quotes. It's only super. Uh, she does say things similar. Things yeah. similar. Yeah, that's, yeah. 
for some reason, they don't seem to have it here. I'm just looking at all these quotes, and they don't show it. Yep, they don't have it. Daniel chapter 11, they don't have it in there. In on my disc, okay. They don't. okay. So, so seems we'll try to, it seems similar to these words. I think there's something um, seems similar will be repeated, even if it just do seem seem similar. We should. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, here it is. Yeah, so this is 13 manuscript releases. So it's volume 13. That's what it is. So she's going to quote verses 31 to 36. So those are the verses we're studying. And I'll show you the quote. I mean, I actually copy this. And we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then verses 31 to 36 are quoted, right? Which are the verses we're looking at right now. She says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. And that she quotes Daniel 12, verse 1 to 4. Uh, the spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn from the world. It is now time for men to ex. It is no time for men to exalt themselves. It is no time for the people of God to be erecting costly buildings or to be using the Lord's entrusted talents of means in glorifying themselves. Whatever we do, we should do economically. The buildings we erect should be plain without useless display. Let us beware of selfish greed. Okay. So we can see here that uh, these verses that we're studying are giving the history for this time. Now I'm going to take this quote, at least those two paragraphs, and put it in this document, just because I think it would be important to have that reference there. It's going to take up a lot of room, but so we've looked at verse 30 and 31 and 32, and we can see how this history is being repeated. That is, what happens with the fall of Western Rome is paralleling what's happening with the fall of the West, right? So, which of course would include the United States. And then we're going to see that there are, that this first goes through this, this history of, you know, after 1798, that it's going to begin in that time. And, and that's because we're paralleling 476 AD to some degree, with 1798. So we have the fall of Western Rome is paralleling the fall of the papacy. And in that period of time, we have this attack that happens. And, you know, and we can see this, obviously, it starts a bit earlier. You know, some people would put 70, 1776 with Adam Weishaupt. Um, that's the Illuminati, right? Things like that. But definitely by the 1800s, we have this sort of systematic satanic attack upon God's word. And it's happening at the time that we have all these uh, Bible societies publishing the Bible, distributing it widely. And at that time, we see this undermining of, of God's word within Christianity itself. Right. So it's sort of these two things that ironically uh, exist, almost a contradiction. So we have this increase of light, and during that increase of light, which is to dispel the darkness, we still have darkness. Just because you have an increase of light doesn't mean that darkness has stopped. And, and that's one of the things we understand about the line. We have a period of darkness, we have a reform message, but there's always going to be the counteracting of that work. And this is the undermining of God's word as an authority. So we know in Millerite history, Protestantism is going to become part of Babylon. Um, in rejecting 
really how to study God's word. And a lot of this has to do with the thinking that is being developed within the schools, within the seminaries, almost said cemeteries, where people who are trained for the ministry are really trained in a type of worldly philosophy. The way that they address the scriptures, they think is intellectual, but it's not uh, truly spiritual. And it doesn't mean that all of the, the preachers everywhere are, you know, to be disregarded completely, but definitely there is generally this idea that education, this, this type of education, is what's going to fit somebody to be a minister. In reality, it's going to be something that's going to make them unfit to be a minister. You know, it's like the school of the rabbis compared to the school of the prophets. It's just a completely different idea. So so we have that happening and we have, so what we're comparing is we're comparing these Germanic tribes coming in and conquering Western Rome with this ideology that's coming in. So it's, it's not a, an actual battle in this case. So if we're going to say that this is a repeat of history, seen similar, you know, some people might argue, well, how do you, how do you compare armies coming in and undermining the, po- the po- political structure of Rome? Uh, how do you compare that to modernism, right? Or, or intellectual ideas? Any thoughts on that? Anybody have any thoughts on how those compare? Because some people would say, well, if you've got scenes similar to this, they're going to be repeated. They would say, well, that doesn't seem similar at all. And she's talking about, of course, not just verse 30, but she's addressing verse 31. And this is the papacy. So we, you know, we have Clovis and we have Theodosius and all these different characters, right? We have what happens with uh, Justinian's decree and, and, um, and I can never remember. You should have it here somewhere in our footnotes in 538. What was the, Yes, um, the Third Council of Orleans in 538, right? So we have a Sunday law, so we can see how that would parallel a Sunday law. And Orleans is named after Aurelian. He dedicated the Temple of Sol Invictus on December 25th, 274 AD, 264 years prior to 538, which is interesting. So, so we have that parallel. And I think primarily it is... I mean, it's not just about verse 30. It is, or, you know, 31 to 36. But really, we apply that this repeat of history is, is all of the, of Daniel chapter 11. And in fact, all of prophecy, all of history has an application to the end, end times. So, so we're not just restricting this. And sometimes those, those connections are, you know, they're definitely not literal. We, we would say that they're, they're figurative, that history is figurative of what's going to happen at the end of time. So we're not looking for Germanic tribes to come in, um, but definitely we have a, a type of vandalism that occurs within Christianity. That is, uh, we have this these ideas that definitely undermine Christianity, and I and I think that that parallel. You know, seems similar. I think I think it it applies there as well. So when we look at verse thirty one and thirty two, so we, we went through this yesterday. You know, the arms standing on um, standing on his part. So that's on behalf of papal Rome. That is, America cooperates with the papacy in our history. In the, in the earlier history, that's going to be France. That's going to be Clovis. And so we're saying that arm standing on his part in the repeat of history is basically this cooperation between the U.S. and the papacy that leads to uh, November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991. So the fall of the Soviet Union. So in this case, then the Soviet Union is is representing it, it, its parallel to some degree with um you know the fall of paganism right pagan rome and yet we say also that pagan rome parallels the united states so there seems to be in some ways that we look at this we make different applications 
depending upon in, in the repeat of history, depending upon the context. So that is the fall of the United States. It happens in two different ways. First, there's the fall of Protestantism. That happens in Millerite history. And then there's the fall of republicanism. But all of this is the fall of the United States. The United States, it's going to make an image to the beast. And, and the problem that we have had, at least the problem that I've had, and I think that most Adventists have had in trying to understand this Sunday law, is we know the United States is the one that creates the image to the beast. And that it's going to bring in the Sunday law and that all the other countries of the world will end up following what the United States is doing. And yet it's a religious Sunday law. It's not a secular Sunday law. It's not to help the environment. It's it's definitely connected. I mean, that is, we're going to see these social socialist institutions such as unions uh, supporting the Sunday law. And they will have some of their reasons. And we know that the mark is on the right hand or the forehead. Now, we, we take that to mean that the, the forehead, that that's the mind, right? That's referring to the person's intellectual consent to that. That is, they're supportive of it intellectually. And then the right hand has to do with the action. So it's, there are some, they may not be totally intellectually behind the Sunday law, but they will at least support it or obey it. That, that's one of the ways that people in turn to re, in, interpret the right hand or the forehead. Because um, when we look at that verse, uh, let's go there. And one of the things that we can see here, too, is that when we're looking at this Daniel 11, verse 30 and onwards, and even some of the earlier verses, we can definitely see that this is Re- Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Right? we got the 1260 days. We could even go back to chapter 11 as well. But we're talking about the woman fleeing into the wilderness and the earth helped the woman. We see the same thing in these verses as well. So we can see Revelation chapter 12. We can see the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome and, and then the rise of the United States. So all of this is part of this history. So it's it's very parallel. And that's why Ellen White says to study the book of Daniel in connection with Revelation. One of them is just what we see in Daniel chapter 11 is shown in Revelation in different symbols. So in verse 16 of chapter 13 of Revelation, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So so it, it's, um, you know, either in their right hand or in their foreheads. And so this word here, um, I'm just looking at the Greek word. So it means distinction between two connected terms. It's a disjunctive or comparative. That's either. So, so we can see that it's not can't be translated as in the right hand and in their foreheads. It's one or the other. So that's one of the arguments for the idea that this is that some people intellectually support it. And some people just support it with their actions, even though they may not intellectually support it. Now, we know, of course, there's the no man might buy or, that no man might buy or sell, save him that had the mark of the name, mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. So there's three different things. They can have the mark of the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I know this is not Daniel chapter 11, but we, we always can study these things in connection. So what would this be? Uh, why is there these three? The mark, the name of the beast, or the number of the name? What is the distinction between these three three things? Okay, well, qu- uh, a question, whether anybody's going to answer it. What would we mean if we say you have the name of the beast? What would that, that mean? Relate to, yeah. That would relate to character. Yes. Okay. So character. So it, now it doesn't say that they have to have all three. They can have the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of the name of his name. So, I mean, we could speculate exactly what those will, all would mean, but we know that they're all different, that somebody can have the mark. And so the mark of the beast, we normally think of as Sunday worship. Right. And that's going to become a certain time when that becomes the mark of the beast. But also 
they can't buy or sell unless they have the name of the beast. So they have to have a certain kind of character in order to buy and sell. And then what about the number of his name? So the number of his name. So we, one thing we can say here is that the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, and the number of his name are not the same things. They're three different things. That's what that word or means, that they're not, it's not an and, it's something distinguishing these things. Now, the number of his name, the 666, which is going to talk about, here's, here's, here's wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 300 to three score and six. So one of the things that talks about the number of his name. So people often look at, you know, Vicarious Filei Dei, um, or the other people look at uh, different titles of the Pope, the Latin man, sometimes people take Nero, and they try to say, well, there's this person who has a name that adds up to 666 in Gematria, and, and that makes him the beast. Now, if we have... Since we have three, so we have three different characteristics of a person having who can't buy or sell. And then we have three different, let me see here. So we got the mark, the name of the beast, the number of the beast. So it's just going to define this number. So we got three different ways. Can we say that this is three different um, divisions of Rome? Could we say that there are, you know, there's Protestants, Catholics, and others? Is that what it would be referring to? Uh, you know, it's, it's just something to consider that there's some people that have the mark, some have the name of the beast, and some have the number of his name. And the number of his name is the one that's 600, three score, and six. And if we look at the 603 score and six, the 666. One of the things we find is this number is used to connect Babylon to pagan Rome and also pagan Rome to the papacy, right? So we have these different periods of 666 years. We have three of them. And um, the one used by Miller was from 158 BC to uh, 508. AD, and that connects uh, basically the start of, of pagan Rome to, so that's going to be paganism taken out of the way in 508. But we also have another one from 129 or 128 to 538. And then the other one that connects Babylon to Rome is the 666 years of Ezekiel. That's where he's counting uh, the captivity of Jehoiachin. In the 666 year of the captivity of Jehoiachin is the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And he's predicting the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 586, but he's indirectly predicting the date of that with the 666 years. So I would say that the 600, three score and six, if we were going to say that this re refers to Babylon as a whole, that the 603 score and six or the number of his name refers to those that are Catholics. They have the number of his name. But then there's those that have the name of the beast. They don't have the number of his name, but they have the name of the beast. That is, they have that character. And I would say that that refers to those that may not be Christians or Sunday keepers, but just the world that accepts. So they have the character of the beast. That would be the UN, right? That would be spiritualism. And those that have the mark, those would be Sunday keepers. They don't have the number of, the, of his name. That is, they're not Catholics. And they don't have the name of the beast in the sense that Obviously, they're going to have that character, but the name, the character or the name of the beast is its persecutory power, right? So we, we can see that that's, uh, we can see that spirit or character in these kingdoms of the world that are totalitarian, the idea of communism and so forth. But the mark of the beast is really just Sunday. And that would be something that Protestants are still observing for the most part. I don't know what people think about that idea, if that makes sense. But one of the things we need to note here is these difference of three, because 
we have these groupings of three quite often. And then in verse 18, where it says, here is wisdom, let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. This is a message to those who are not going to receive the mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. That's to those that's going to be a message to the 144,000. Right. And that's why, you know, you have that. Chapter 14 is going to follow chapter 13, and it's going to bring us to the 144,000. Those are the ones that are going to have wisdom, right? And we see a similar thing also at the end of chapter 6, where they're going to have this question for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And the answer is chapter 7, 144,000 again. So there's these structures that often we miss out when, you know, because of the chapter divisions, people don't see this continuation. <clears throat> and of course, it's always been interesting to me that you have uh, Revelation 7 and 14 and then uh, 21, all these divisions of seven. And this is going to deal with the new heaven and the new earth where you can have the new Jerusalem and, uh, it's going to be this symbolism of the 12 tribes, the 12 gates, the 144,000, then all uh, described here as well. So I think that's interesting, chapter 7, 14, and 21. But getting back to Daniel chapter 11, then, we can see these parallels. So when we deal with this Sunday law, um, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Those are those that have wisdom. And, and you can see this contrast in verse 32. There's such as do wickedly against the covenant that are going to be corrupted by flatteries. But the people that do know, know their God shall be strong and do exploits or do. They that understand among the people, those that are wise, shall understand, shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, and by spoil many days. Now, we know that this persecution that's going to happen, this is... Historically, this is talking about uh, the persecutions that's going to happen under the papacy, right? Uh, 1260 years. But now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So we're going to see that some are going to be saved and some aren't. And some of them of understanding shall fall, right? Now, here, to try them, to purge them, and to make them white even to the time of the end. Obviously, it's not the ones that fall that are tried, purged, and made white. It's just the fact that some of understanding fall, that's going to be trying those that don't fall, right? So the fact that you have the church falling and you have uh, Christians who are being faithful, that is a purification process. But more specifically, we take this verse and we connect it to Millerite history so that this trying, purging, and making them white, is in this history in which Babylon falls, which is the Protestants fall. And it's even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. So we know this is from 1798 to 1844 in the historical application of this verse. And and we compare this in Daniel chapter 12, where verse 10, where it says, many shall be purified, made white, and tried. So it's the same idea, just in reverse. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. So we see understanding is for the wise, and not understanding, that's for the wicked. Right? And then it's going to talk about the time of the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up. So that's verse 31 of Daniel 11. But it's going to just refer us back to that. And then give this period of time. So we have two different periods of time, actually. The 1290, which is going to end in 1798. And then the 1335, that's going to end on April 19th, 1844. Right. So we can see how these tie together. How what's, what's at the end of Daniel chapter 12 ties to what we're studying in Daniel chapter 11. And how the, also this connects in a sense, in the repeat of history, though, it's going to be addressing the end of that 1260, where we're going to have the United States rise, right? So we're, we're brought again to Millerite history, 
you know, chapter 11, 12, and 13 are all going to bring us to, to this Millerite history in, in various ways. Chapter 14 as well in, in the three angels' messages, though it's, it's trying to bring us to the end as we move through Revelation, as it does this repeat and enlarge, it keeps bringing us further to the end, right? So they repeat, enlarge, add more detail, but also bring us a little further. So the book of Revelation is not written in a chronological order of events, which I've seen a lot of Christians try to interpret it that way. Uh, and of course, they take lots of things literally, especially time periods, but some of them even take the beasts <coughs> literally. They don't take almost anything as symbols. Okay. So hopefully that that's helpful to kind of frame what it is we're doing here. So I guess I should go back to the document now. So we went through verse 31 and 32 and we we have in the present truth application. I think it's pretty clear. It brings us up to the loud cry from November 9th, 1989 to the loud cry. And um, we also had. So when we looked at. um 9-11 9-11 and the Patriot Act, the ed- Edict of Theodosius in 391, lining up with the Patriot Act. Um, I should put some footnotes in there because we had a bunch of, of symbols. I don't know. I think we just put it in the chart that we had. So let me see. No. What did we do with that? Well, maybe we should just review that anyway. Okay, we dealt with Sanctuary of Strength. So that was one of them. So the Sanctuary of Strength... Um, seven, four, seven, two, zero and sanctuary four, five, eight, one. Uh, they add up to nine, three, zero, one. But if we do the difference between them, it's one thirty nine, which of course is another symbol for three ninety one. So I guess I did have the footnotes on that. And obviously we have three ninety one AD. So that's going to, uh, be the period from the, the for the second woe. And we know that that ends August 11th, 1840, and that 9-11 is the third woe, and it it parallels the second woe as far as the um, empowerment of the first angel's message. Okay, so so I think we got that there. I think that's what we had. They shall take away the daily. This typifies the tide being turned against wokeism, which hasn't happened yet. So Stephen uh, pointed this out. So if we have 508... Uh, we have the tide being turned against wokeism. Now, I think it is beginning so that the taking away of the daily, obviously, there's going to be a point where we'll see this quite clearly. So it's going to represent this wokeism, this paganism, and that's hindering uh, the placing of the abomination that make it desolate. So that's hindering the image of the beast. So if we think about the image of the beast, that's the United States. Now, how is the image of the beast formed? What if if we look up in the spirit of prophecy and we talk about the image of the beast? What does she say about it? It being formed. How is it formed? Stephen, you got? I can't hear you. I can see you. Well, she talks about it being the great past of the people of God. Okay, but how is it being formed? So um, stretching the hand over the gulf or whatever. To, um, okay. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's kind of like a religious. Okay, so she has some swing. Yeah. yeah. So there's definitely it's it's a religious thing, right? Okay. So so the image of the beast is a religious issue. It's not a secular issue. Now Ella White, you know, asked the question that I asked, and she she gives an answer, and this is uh, 443 of the Great Controversy. What is the image to the beast and how is it to be formed? The image is made by the two horned beast and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. Right. So she's now going to go through this history that we were looking at in Daniel chapter 11, how the beast itself, the papacy, was formed. And it's interesting that it says she mentions that it's an image to the beast and an image of the beast. So that means it's an image in worship of the beast. 
right? Or worship to the beast. But it's also made in the same image as the beast. Um, so then she says, when the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to her to further her own ends especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image to the bees, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Whenever the church has obtained secular power, she has employed it to punish dissent from her doctrines. Protestant churches have followed in the steps of Rome by forming an alliance with worldly powers and have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. An example of this is given in the long continued persecution of dissenters by the Church of England. During the 16th and 17th centuries, thousands of nonconformist ministers were forced to flee from their churches, and many, both pastors and people, were subjected to fine, imprisonment, torture, and martyrdom. Um, it was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of the civil government. Now, she's going to go on and on about this, but we can see clearly that this is religious in nature. OK, that this image to the beast, the United, and this is the thing that had troubled me all this time as a Seventh-day Adventist. How is that going to happen? And, and we've seen people sort of propose, you know, the environmental Sunday law is probably what's going to happen or you know, even the vaccination Sunday law type of thing, which is not a religious Sunday law. So so this image to the beast, <laughs> you see um, that there are two two aspects to it. Do you have some more comments, Stephen? You still got your mic on. No, I didn't realize my mic was on. Okay, okay. I was just wondering. So we know that in Millerite history, this is a two-horned beast, right? It arises in 1798. And we have the first horn fall, that is Protestantism. Now, Protestantism, its fall is only partial, and it's going to continue to fall. It's progressive fall. But really, when it has its complete fall is in our time. And it's at that time that the Republican horn falls, right? So remember, it's Republicanism and Protestantism. It's not, it's not uh, dem democracy and Protestantism. It's the Republican horn. And so we understand that this is a Republican government that brings in the Sunday law. That is, Republicanism has to fall. At least that's that's how we have understood it, that we're not looking for a Democratic, the Democratic Party, to be in power when the Sunday law comes. Now, you know, we know that we, we we've looked at this and this tide being turned against wokeism. So this is a backlash. It, it is, uh, you know, the, if we're going to use the tide idea, you know, the tide has come in, right? We have all of this worldliness, the secularism, this communism, this, all of these ideologies uh, permeating our culture. But it, it becomes where people people become tired with it. Now, sometimes we suggest, well, maybe there's some disaster. Maybe there's a nuclear war. Maybe there's different types of things that would cause people to become more religious or, or at least support the religious right in in bringing in a Sunday law and it, it sort of as, as a desperation. Now, one of the things we see, and, and often we're, you know, we see this type of totalitarianism coming in with the left, right? So the left has brought in a type of totalitarianism. We see this in Canada. We see it in Ireland. Uh, you know, a lot of the the freedoms, you know, freedom of speech being uh, attacked, things like that. And so, people are worried about the left. And so we, you know, conservatives. So conservatives are concerned about the left, and they talk about the Constitution and, and all these freedoms. But the reality is when they have power 
even if some of those people are quite sincere in what they believe, we would expect that the same sort of suppression of freedom of speech will happen when the right gets power. When the conservatives have power, they'll do the same things. Everything's set up for that to happen. And, and so what it takes is it takes something to happen within the population to support, support this. And I don't know if it needs to be like a nuclear war or some kind of disaster. But I do think that the, that the United States is moving towards a, a, a civil war, whether Trump is elected or not. And so we're see, we're going to see the fall, the fall of Repu- the Republican horn in some way. How, how that's going to happen, we don't know. And so people have different scenarios. You know, Trump gets elected. He's going to become a dictator. He's going to bring in a Sunday law. But we know that you know, Trump isn't going to have support of all the Americans. So if Trump comes in, I mean, we would see a civil war. And if he's trying to bring in a Sunday law, well, that would actually not be fulfilling this prophecy because it would be something that's pushed upon the American populace where my understanding is that this is something that has popular support, not just 47% of the population support and that this would be the result of either. I I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know what's going to happen if the Democrats win. um, We we just don't know what's going to happen in this next year. You know, Biden could die uh, before the election. So there's just lots of things that can happen. He's old, right? So there's just lots of things that can happen. And lots of scenarios that can be imagined. What we need to recognize is that this is a religious Sunday law, that it's going to be uh, supported by everyone except God's people. And I don't think it's something that we're going to see in 2024 or 2025. I could be wrong. Maybe maybe things are going to unfold in some ways that we can't expect, and, and I'm sure lots of things will. But there is also a message that has to be, be given, right? Because they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Now, when you look at this word, uh, many, 7227, we're going to go there. Let's take a look at it here. That's the word rab, rab, rab would be ancient Hebrew, Rav, they say Rav in modern Hebrew. And we look at this word, it's, it's, it shows up many times, okay? 469 times in the Bible. And, and so it has lots of different, uh, ways much. It can mean captain, more, enough. But the ones that I'm interested in is how Daniel uses it. And, um, so we're going to see in Daniel 7, verse 1 and 2, um, that's the word great. I want, I don't want that one. I want the word when he uses it, um, as the word many. So we're going to see it lots in Daniel chapter 11, 11 verse 14. Um, and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, Daniel 11 verse 18. It says he, um, after this shall he turn his face unto the Oz and shall take many, uh, Daniel 11 verse 26. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. It's in verse 33 and 34, right? They that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. Many days is not in there. The many is not in there. Just days. And when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 39 and four to 41, we have, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, right, and shall divide the land for gain. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, right? And in verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. And uh, 1144, the tidings out of east and out of north shall trouble him. Therefore shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. And Daniel 1112, or Daniel 12, pardon me, 
verse um, three to four. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And then, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So what do we see about this word many? I mean, it's a common English word as well, but how is it being used here? And it's also translated as the word great, by the way. So why, why are we using this word many? What, what is it about many? Okay, well, let's look at this one in particular. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So what is it about many that we see here? It's in contrast to what? You got many and you have some. Now, this word, alayla, alayla. No, they're doubling. The, it's got a gagish in the language. Okay. Now, it's often translated or it comes from these or those. Another, one sort, some, some, such, them, these, they, this, those, thus, which. Okay. So we have many that, how many are going to arise in, in Daniel 12 verse 2? So, so when it talks about many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, when is this resurrection? Anybody know? Now, it's talking about when Christ comes back and all eyes shall see him. So they all rise in that sense. Okay, so this is this is the special resurrection, right? Oh, okay. This is a special resurrection, the saints that's thing only. Yeah, that's my understanding that this is referring to the special resurrection, not to uh, because you're going to have when Christ returns, you're going to have some people that um, are going to be resurrected, and uh, they're going to be. All those that were there at Christ's crucifixion, that participated in that, and all all those that died under the third angel's message. So when it comes to um, this verse here, I'm going to, so this is something, people are discussing this on one of the study groups. So this is from early writings. Let me see if I can find this. Yeah, so I'll show you what I'm looking at. It was at midnight that God chose to deliver his people. As the wicked were mocking around them, suddenly the sun appeared, shining in its strength, and the moon stood still. Uh, the wicked looked upon the scene with amazement, while the saints beheld with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Signs and wonders followed in quick succession. Everything seemed turned out of its natural course. The streams ceased to flow. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. But there was one clear place of settled glory, whence the voice of God, like many waters, shaking the heavens and the earth, which came to look okay. There was a mighty earthquake. The graves were open, and those who had died in faith, under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath, came forth from their dusty beds, glorified, to hear the covenant of peace that God was to make with those who kept his law. So this is going to refer to some to everlasting life, right? So that's going to be the 144,000. I think, so there's that group. I wonder if this has it. Are you uh, considering the 144,000, those who are resurrected? No, no. No, those with the 144,000. So they're going to be there with right. the 144,000. I may have misspoken. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they're going to come up there and they're going to be with the 144,000 at that time. Okay, so this one here, this is Great Controversy 637. Graves are opened and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, Daniel 12, 2. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him, Revelation 1, verse 7, those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory, to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. So what we have here is we're going to have, because we have the 144,000 there, 
They're going to be the ones that are going to go through this time of trouble. And at the end of that period, we have those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life. So they're going to be there with the 144,000 and then some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, when it says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, then this is not all of them. Not everyone's going to be resurrected, but we're going to have some. Now, it could be translated these to everlasting life and those to shame and everlasting contempt. That would be a completely correct translation of, of the Hebrew because the word some can be translated as these and those. Okay. And, and we can see that, uh, if I click on this word, you can see that 721 times in the Bible it's translated as these, 40 times as those, right? And some, uh, it's translated six times. Right? So you can see that, that we translated into English as some. Oh, you can't see what I'm looking at right now because I changed the screen. So you can see here, see that 721 times is these. It's a lot, lot of weight. So, so it easily could be translated. It could even be translated because in Hebrew, there isn't a distinct distinction between these and those, right? It doesn't have that in their grammar. So it's just, it's just this one word, LL, 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 LL. You can't say it anyway. <clears throat> and so. So they can easily translate it as many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. These to everlasting life and these to shame and everlasting contempt. Right. Or you could translate it these and those just to, to make a distinction. But the point that I have here is that many, because that's what we're looking at, is this word many. So generally it, it means great. Right. So it's often translated as great. So, but here it says, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Now, so it's abundant, right? A large amount of people. So we know that this is obviously going to be referring to a period of the loud cry, right? It happened in, in the dark ages that we had, you know, group of people, different, different groups, uh, the Lollards, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, you know, different groups. Um, that we're instructing many, and we're going to have this in our time. So, so the God's people at the end, when the Sunday law comes in, we're going to have this loud cry and instructing many. One thing we can say about many is it isn't few, right? So, um, and these people, it says, yet they shall fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days, right? So we know that many of the people who are going to be, who are going to understand are not just 144,000 because the ones who are martyrs who are going to die are not part of 144,000. So people are going to come in and there will be people also who are part of the message who don't become part of the 144,000 because they're going to be martyrs. But there is going to be in this group, you know, the group that are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, that means when we look at um, uh, verse 35, because remember, we're taking this history and we're just saying it's going to be repeated. So some of them understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. So that means we're going to have some who are going to fall. And that's going to be a test to those that are alive. And it, and it could mean here that not so that they fall morally, but that they're going to be killed. Right. It could be what it means. But here this means to totter and waver this word fall by implication to falter or stumble. So we normally use this in the sense of a moral fall. And, and that's, the, I think, primarily what would be referred to, because we already have them talking about all of those that are going to be persecuted. Now it says, now when they shall fall. So here, even though this, this is talking about persecution. So we have fall here. This is talking about persecution, right? And now when they shall fall, again, persecution, so the shawl, they shall be holpen with a little help. And that's the word little or few, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. 
and some of them of understanding shall fall. Now, again, this is that same word. So often it can be used in a moral fall, but also we can see here it's going to be used in the sense of being persecuted, being killed. So I'm just saying here that it's being used in a different sense than it is here, even though it's the same word. But we can use the same word fall. You know, they're going to fall by the sword, right? It says up in verse 33. But we can say that they're going to fall morally. And this is to try and purge and make white God's people, even to the time of the end, right? So that's going to be 1798. Because it is yet for an appointed time, October 22, 1844. Right, so it's that period of Millerite history. So that's repeating our history. But we can see here these, this, um, if we're going to have a repeat of this history, because that's what we're trying to address here, how, where would we place this repeat of history? Okay, so this is where we are in our notes. So hopefully all that preamble just kind of helps us focus on what it is we want to do with these verses 33 to 35. So they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So historically, you know, and so they that understand, we, we can simply just say that these are the wise. And in our history, that generally refers to the 144,000. We, we call them the wise. Now, there's also some who are going to be wise that won't be part of the 144,000. But generally, when we talk about those that understand, <coughs> that are wise, that's 144,000. And they're going to be among the people. So I put here faithful Christians in, in this history. So when we're saying among the people, these would be the people of God. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. So I don't know what we put with faithful Christians. Because so that's in that history of time. So it's not just 144,000. Those are among the people. The people are being, um, we'll say, say Seventh-day Adventists. Maybe I'll take out faith and just put among the Christians. So we got Seventh-day Adventists. So this is a proclamation. And, and this instruction here, 995, it's, uh, is a word that means, uh, to discern, understand, consider. So usually it's it's the idea of of understanding, discerning, right? Um, but in the form which it means to instruct or to teach, and that's a form I'm not familiar with. The Polel form, hmm. never seen that form before. So uh, let me see here. So this is verse. I just got to look this up. What this form and why they use it as instruct. I got to make sure that that's exactly what's going on. Being, being. The, the word is actually is in Hebrew is being, which is a strange. I'm just trying to look at what this pole well. Oh, it's the variation of the PL, which I'm familiar with. Never seen this before in Hebrew. So it has to do with non non hollow or hollow verbs. Okay, sorry about that. I'm just trying to figure out exactly why why it's translated as instruct. I've never seen that form. So anyway, this idea of instructing many, I can't get much. So this is obviously going to be teaching. But the idea is that it's not just that they're instructing them, right? Because this word itself really has to do with a type of discernment. So when we think of instruction. So, you know, I'm a guitar teacher, you know, and I, I teach guitar. That's what guitar teachers do. And I usually say that I'm not teaching guitar, that I'm actually teaching guitar students. Right? That is, I'm, I'm addressing that individual and helping them learn guitar. So I'm teaching them how to learn, how to practice, how to understand music, how to analyze music. Right. So that when they uh, that I'm not just merely teaching them where to put their fingers for a particular song, but I'm teaching them how to interpret music, how to play expressively, how to understand, um, you know, phrasings and rhythms. And uh, so that they don't need me as a teacher eventually. And so when we think about how most people instruct, you know, if you think about school, 
you have some kind of test that a person has to pass. You know, if they can get, you know, a certain percentage, uh, then they pass. But that's not really instruction in, in this biblical sense. Now, the idea is that you're making this person, you're giving them a knowledge base that they can operate and act on their own, right? That's what you really ultimately want to have. You want to have a person who not is not just instructed in the sense that they've been told something, but they're actually now able to teach themselves. So that's why I was interested in this word, uh, shall instruct many, because I really think that this word has not so much to do with just teaching somebody something directly, but actually teaching people to teach. And I normally have a site that I go to that gives me a parsing of the word. And for some reason, that site is down. And, and that helps me understand the form of the word a lot better. But it's not working right now. So I have no idea why it's not. It's always worked before. Okay. So, but that's what I, I, I think from this, this idea, instruct many. That this is more than just you know, going out and spreading the gospel. This is making disciples, right? The, the, the truth is going to spread, not from one place. You know, it's not like we're going to set up a website and everybody's going to go to our website and receive instruction. That the idea is that this is going to spread, that all of the different studies we do, people are going to study. They're going to know how to study. And they're going to be able to show other people's other people how to study, right? That we're going to have a people all over the world, and not necessarily even from us directly, spreading the truth. So they that understand among the people, right? That is among Seventh Day Adventists, shall instruct many, right? They're going to spread the light of truth. That's going to be true um, uh, in in both the past and the present. Yet the faithful shall fall by the sword. So there's going to be a lots, lots of persecution by flame, by captivity, and by spoil. Now, why is there four mentioned? So a lot of times we have three. So three represents the three angels' message. What does four represent? Uh, we normally associate the number four with worldwide. Okay, we can. We also can represent it to a progressive destruction of four, right? So, yes, so sometimes it can be universal because of the four directions of the compass, but also, you know, the four seven times, right? So this, or the four generations. So I think here, wouldn't it be more that we're looking at this progression of persecution by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil, that it's now... We primarily apply this then to the 1260 years, right? This is the persecution that's happening in that time. So that's the way that I would look at it. So, so it can be universal, which I think that would apply here as well. But there's, there's these four. Now, whether we would mark these as specific events or four generations, but I would think here that this, if we're going to make the present truth application, that's because that's what we're focusing on right now. That in the four generations or in this period of time, that this, this period of time would include the whole time of Adventism after the period of the 1260 years, right? We're going to have, what was this here? I'm missing it here. Okay. Right. So, so it's going to talk about this progressive destruction of four historically. So when we're looking at this historically, it's referring to the period of 1260 years. Okay. So what would the period of 1260 years represent in the present truth application? 538 to 1798. So could we put this from 1844 to 1989? This would be the four generations of Adventism. Is that a wilderness? Is it a period of darkness that's going to develop? Now, we could maybe even argue that it's just the fourth generation, 1957 to 
the fourth generation being the focus. But the captivity is the fourth one. And so I would look at this as the progressive destruction of four if you compare it with uh, the four seven times, sword, flame, captivity. Oh, and the fourth one is spoil, right? So that would be the final one, spoil. So to be robbed of something. So that'd be the fourth generation. So they're robbed of the truth or something like that. Now, I, I want to look at these numbers. I know where time is up here for today. So things to consider for Sunday is I want people to look at these verses, 33 to 35, because we're going to go through these, putting the present truth. I'm going to look at some of these, these numbers, uh, such as the sword, flame, prison, and uh, spoil and see if this gives us yields anything that we can connect this to in the present truth application to Miller to Adventist history. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, let's close with prayer. Dear father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We pray for Dwight and his family and uh, we pray for each person here and the families that are represented. And we pray for our church families and uh, for our loved ones. We pray that we can come together um, on Sunday to continue studying these things. And we pray for the studies tomorrow evening and on Sabbath. We just ask, Lord, that we can learn of you. Uh, continue to teach us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.